News of the Times. Serial Killer Saturdays. Martin Dumelard, the Maid Killer. Welcome to News of the Times. In today's episode, it is 1862 in France. Martin Dumelard, described as a peasant, is on trial for a string of murders dating back to 1855, although it is expected there are many more unaccounted for. Dumelard and his wife live in a backward shack in the country. Dumelard would make trips into Lyon, scouting for young girls looking for work and positions as a maid. Unsuspecting girls, enticed by the idea of working in a chateau at incredible pay, follow. This astounding case, similar in nature to the famous Vakia serial killer case we covered, continues to fascinate with questions remaining as to just how many young girls Dumoulard did kill, outrage and rob. We delve into the story of Dumoulard, his crimes and his capture in today's episode of Serial Killer Saturdays. We hope you enjoy the show. Background Martin Dumoulard's family originally came from Hungary. There are vague references of Martin's father attempting to escape Hungary due to crimes he had committed there. Most significantly, Martin's father was captured by Hungarian forces, executed and dismembered. Four-year-old Martin and his mother watched the gruesome execution. Martin began work as a shepherd at the age of eight. It is in his capacity here that he met his wife, Marie-Anne Martinet. The couple eventually settled in Dagneur. Martin, by all accounts, was not described as an attractive man, so he was not attracting the young women by his charm and good looks. However, collected statements speak of his good French and his seemingly relaxed manner. His pitch was for him being a head gardener in a chateau with his imaginary master having sent him out to obtain additional domestic help at good wages. He played the part well and by all accounts was very believable. From the Express, London, the 1st of February 1862, Martin Dumoulard. A man named Dumoulard, an ugly villain marked by a scar and a tumour in the upper lip, has been in the habit for seven years of murdering and robbing servant girls, who he then lured into lonely places under the pretext of conducting them to good situations. The Crimes As we regularly see with serial killers, it is often the last killing which unravels the previous series. Such is the case with Martin Dumoulard. From the Bista Advertiser, the 31st of January, 1862, an extraordinary trial for murder in France. The most intense excitement has been masked throughout France by the trial of a man named Martin Dumoulard, a labourer, who for the last eight years has been in the habit of murdering and robbing servant girls under the pretense of conducting them to good situations. Fifteen cases of murder or attempted murder are alleged against him, and it is suspected that he must be guilty of many more crimes of a similar nature. His wife was indicted as an accomplice, the trial took place at Bourg, in the department of N. The following account of the extraordinary charges against the prisoners is obtained from the official act of accusation. On the 25th of May, 1861, about 11 o'clock at night, a woman knocked at the door of Monsieur Jolie, 
an inhabitant of the village of Bilau, and asked for the protection from an assassin, out of whose hands she had just escaped. Her name was Marie Pichon. She, she was at once taken before the police authorities at Montleur, to whom she made the following statement. She had come from Lyon, where she had been living as a domestic servant. As she was crossing the bridge de la Gulotiere, she was accosted by a countryman clad in blue blouse with a hump on his back and having a scar and a swelling on his upper lip. This individual acquired of her the address of a registry office and entered into conversation with her. He told her that he was employed as a gardener at a chateau near Montleur and had that he had been sent to Lyon for the purpose of engaging a servant. The place was a most advantageous one, the wages being 250 francs a year, besides prerequisites. Thrown off her guard, Maria Pichon accepted the offer. She at once got ready her clothes and, accompanied by her guide, took the train to Montleur, where they arrived soon after nightfall. The man, putting a box on his shoulder, told Marie to follow him, saying that he intended to take a shortcut to their destination. Suddenly, after having passed across several ploughed fields, the stranger stopped in the middle of a meadow and put down the box, saying that he was too tired to carry it any further, but that he would go on for it with the coach the next morning and take it to the chateau. They then resumed their journey, but this incident caused Marie to feel somewhat uneasy. Soon afterwards they came to a hill and began to ascend it, Marie Pichon observed that her companion seemed anxious that she should go first. She had before remarked that he had armed himself with a heavy stick, and now she noticed that he stooped down several times to pick up stones. When they had proceeded a few paces further on, she saw him thrust his hand under his blouse as though he was about to draw forth a weapon, Terrified, she stopped and said, I see you have deceived me. I will go no further. We have arrived at our destination, replied the stranger, and at the same time stretching out his arms in the direction of his victim, who saw that a cord with a slip knot was above her head. She dropped a bandbox and an umbrella which she was carrying and raised both her hands arrested the fall of the instrument of murder. Marie Pichon then took to flight, and she fell several times and bruised herself severely. At last she beheld a light in a cottage window, and in a minute more she was safe under the roof of Monsieur Joly in the village of Balau. The search made for the box and other articles was fruitless. The disappearance of these so seemed to indicate that the culprit was not far distant, and this supposition was strengthened by the fact that he was acquainted with the neighbourhood. The attention of the officers was directed to the occupiers of a house situated at Meffer, in the vicinity of the place to which the woman Pichon had been led. The authorities took Marie's story seriously. It was also noted that there were similarities to her story and other prospective maids claiming escaping assault in the area over the years. Residents of the area were questioned and all answers seemed to lead to Martin Dumoulard and his wife. Martin was known to the authorities with a criminal record of two robberies. From the Bista Advertiser, the 31st of January, 1862, the bad character of the man who resided there, coupled with the dissimulated behaviour of his wife, the nocturnal excursions of the husband, 
and the striking resemblance he bore to the description of the malefactor who was wanted induced the juge de paix to proceed to the house of this man, Martin Dumoulard, to demand of him an account of how he had employed his time on that night. The embarrassed manner of Dumoulard and his wife, their contradictory replies, and the presence in their abode of a quantity of articles confirmed the suspicions which were entertained. Dumoulard was arrested, and forthwith conveyed to Trevaux, where he was confronted on the evening of the same day with Marie Pichon, who recognised him. The evidence of identity was corroborated by testimony of other persons who had seen the man in Lyon in the company of his intended victim on the day in question. The woman, his wife, who had compromised herself by her false and contradictory statements, and also by the anxiety she evinced to conceal certain suspicious articles, was likewise taken into custody. Investigations The investigations proceeded. The small house was searched where large quantities of clothes, personal items, and the belongings of Marie Pichon were found. From the Bister Advertiser, 31st of January, 1862. Several searches were made in the house and resulted in the discovery of a large quantity of clothes, linen trunks, boxes, fragments of lace and other articles, all likely to have belonged to domestic servants. Among these spoils, of which many bore traces of blood, particular attention was directed to some garters of different forms and colour, which appeared to have belonged to different persons. The police also found some pieces of stuff which had been taken from the box of Marie Pichon, and also articles of clothing belonging to women who had been assassinated. There seemed to be no question as to Dumoulard's guilt in regard to the attempt on Marie Pichon. However, the varied number of items found in the house, which would seem to have belonged to a number of different younger girls, aroused questions as to what exactly Marie Pichon had escaped from. Previous reports of missing girls and reported attacks were reviewed and the beginning of a list of serial killings of young girls began to emerge. From the Bister Advertiser, 31st of January, 1862, the crimes which were subsequently brought to light extended over a period between February 1855 and May 1861. The act of accusation recounts a large number of these murders and attempted murders, amongst the most remarkable of which is at that of Marie Badet, a young servant of Lyon, and, and the attempt upon the life of Olympia Alibert, another servant. The, the latter victim, being deceived by the promise of 250 francs of wages, unhesitatingly departed with her pretended guide, and after a long journey they arrived at nightfall in the environs of Tramoy. They were approaching the forest of Montraverel, where some days previously the bleeding body of Marie Badet had been discovered, when, affrighted by the solitude of the place, Olympia Alibert declared that she would proceed no further, and suddenly quitting her companion, she fled into a neighbouring farmhouse. The act of accusation then enters into particulars of two successive attempts made in the months of October and November 1855, the objects being two servant girls, Josephine Charlotte and Jean-Marie Bourgois. Both of them escaped by flight from the consequences of their imprudent confidence and both lost their luggage and their money. The act of accusation goes on to say that from November 
1855 to the close of the year 1858, no crime committed by the accused has been publicly charged against him. In December 1858, however, he resumes his diabolical vocation, for by engaging a young servant maid at Lyon, he conducted her to the wood of Montbain, and there, in the middle of the night, he first violated her, and then, having wounded her in the most serious manner, buried her whilst she was still alive. After tracing a number of robberies committed by the same means, the victims, always being dependents, decoyed from Lyon, who only escaped death by flight and leaving their property in the hands of the accused, the act of accusation relates the particulars of the last murder committed by him on the 26th of February, 1858, and then concludes by stating that during the eight years in which the prisoner has pursued his career of crime, six of his victims were murdered after being violated, and nine other girls providentially escaped from their assailant, although four of the latter number were compelled to leave in his hands the property which had excited his cupidity. And what of his wife? Surely she must have known what was going on. She and Dumelard were separated in jail, and under intense questioning she admitted her part of the crimes, in that she was aware of what was happening and would take the goods and sell them. She also gave full disclosure of the crimes of her husband, Martin Dumoulard. She knew what her husband was doing to the girls, but was able to direct the police to where some of the bodies lay. The bodies that were found inevitably were completely naked. Horrifyingly, it would seem that at least some of the bodies had been buried alive. From the Dublin Evening Mail, the 3rd of February, 1862, Fearful Murders and Outrages in France The Assizes of the Department at saint anne in France, sitting at Bourg, are at present engaged in the trial of a man and a woman charged with one of the most extraordinary systems of crime known in the annals of guilt. The male prisoner is named Martin Dumoulard, aged 52, and the female is his wife, Marianne Martinet, aged 47. It appeared from the evidence, and indeed from the confession of Dumoulard himself and of his wife, that for many years back the man had been in the habit of accosting young females who looked like domestic servants, representing himself as a person sent to hire a servant for a gentleman's country house inducing them to accompany him some distance until they reached a neighbouring wood and there throwing a cord around their necks and attempting to outrage and murder them. In one very recent instance, a girl escaped from his hands and seeing the lights of a railway line in the distance, ran in that direction and obtained a refuge. Her description of her assailant combined with the fact that similar statements had been made at distant intervals by other girls, caused an inquiry to be vigorously set on foot, and Dumoulard, who appeared to have no regular mode of livelihood, was suspected. A search was made of his house, and an immense quantity of female garments was found there, such as forty bonnets, fifty-seven pairs of stockings, fourteen dresses, and a heap of corsets, petticoats, chemises, etc. Dumoulard, being arrested and identified by the girl who had escaped, confessed that he had been for years in the habit of decoying girls into the forest, but stated that he was only the agent of a gang who employed him for that purpose, and who gave him the clothes for his reward. He denied that he had himself committed any of the outrages or murders. The woman who lately escaped and several others who likewise identified Dumoulard stated, however, there was no one 
with him or near him when he attempted the crimes. A search in the forest discovered the dead body of a young woman very recently buried. The body was quite naked, and what was peculiarly horrifying was that the hands were found clasped full of the fresh earth heaped above, and the legs drawn up, thus giving rise to more than suspicion that the unfortunate girl had been buried before life had wholly departed. The skull was marked with two terrible wounds. In another part of the forest, another body was in a decayed condition, likewise that of a young woman, and stripped of all clothing. Subsequent researchers, directed indeed partly by Dumoulard himself, discovered two female skeletons. It ascertained that within some years many of the girls have disappeared from the neighbourhood, some of whom have left their homes with the intention of seeking employment in Lyon or Paris. The bodies which are capable of identification have been fully identified. Among the clothing found in Dumoulard's house are several articles bearing the initials of girls whose fate is yet undiscovered. In some instances there are the inner garments which could not have been obtained without violence. Known Victims There has always been a suspicion that Dumoulard had killed far more than he had admitted to. His usual modus operandi was to knock the victims, thereby disabling her, rape her, strip her of clothing and bury her, often alive. The list of known victims are Marie Badet, February 1855, Olympia Albert, March the 4th, 1855, Joseph Charlotte, September the 22nd, 1855, Jeanine Marie Bourgois, October the 31st, 1855, Victorine Perrin, November 1855, an identified woman's body found in the woods of Montmain in November and December 1855, Julie Varget, January 18, 1859, an identified woman's body found in the Saint Croix Mill, December the 11th, 1859. The Laborde Daughter in the Inn, February 1860. Louise Michel, April the 30th, 1860. Marie Oulial Bousseau, February the 25th or 26th, 1861. And the attempted murder of Marie Pichon, May the 26th, 1861. The Trial The trial was a foregone conclusion with no question of his guilt. Dumoulard received the death sentence while his wife, as co-conspirator, received twenty years' hard labour. From the Sheffield Daily Telegraph, the 3rd of February, 1862, Crime in France. The trial of Dumoulard and his wife, which has caused such a great sensation, was brought to a close today. It was proved that during the last eight years the male prisoner has outraged and murdered six girls whom he had enticed into a lonely place under the pretense of conducting them to situations. Nine other girls who were decoyed in a similar manner providentially escaped. Dumoulard was condemned to death and his wife to twenty years' imprisonment. The correspondent of the Globe writing on this subject says there is a dreadful case of an atrocious land corsair whose foul deeds are in course of detail before provincial tribunal in Bourg near Lyon, where the trial of Dumoulard is now proceeding. This miscreant has prowled the country for years in quest of female servants seeking employ, enticing his victims into secluded by-lanes for rape, murder and robbery. Upwards of fourteen corpses he had hidden in unblessed graves 
having turned up in damning evidence against him, and nothing half so cold-blooded in the annals of depravity has been known. His father, it seems, has been a malefactor of the deepest dye in Hungary. Appeal Attempt and Execution Unsurprisingly, Dumoulard's appeal request was quickly rejected. Dumoulard was informed that he would be executed by the guillotine. His response, I like it better than to be like a f my father quartered on a wheel being pulled in all directions by horses. Dumoulard never repented. For his execution, an estimated 5,000 crowded around the guillotine to watch him to be beheaded. In France, the event was a sensation and was the only topic of conversation for the majority. From the Express of London, 10th of March, 1862, the execution of Dumoulard. The evening papers are full of details of the last moments of Dumoulard. He was informed at four on Friday afternoon that the court of cessation had rejected his appeal and that he would be executed on Saturday morning. He answered quite coolly, as well tomorrow as later. The chaplain of the prison and the curé of Bourg came to visit him a few minutes afterwards, and he promised them that he would confess before he died. That expression must be understood as referring to the sacrament of confession according to the Romish Church, and not to any public revelation of his crimes, for all the accounts confirm the telegraphic statement that he made none. At six o'clock his irons were struck off, and he seemed greatly pleased at this relief. He asked to see his wife, whom he had hitherto refused to see, took supper with her in the presence of the chaplain, and was formally reconciled. He spoke to her very sensibly, and advised her, if she should obtain a pardon, not to go back to her old home, because she would be pointed at. When the time came for setting out for the place of execution, he was allowed to change the prison dress for his own clothes. He picked out the worst for his own wear and put aside the others, saying that they were for his wife. At eleven o'clock he left the Borg prison in a cart spread with straw and, accompanied by the chaplain and two gendarmes, travelled through the dead of night, arriving at Montelieu at four in the morning. During the journey his conversation turned upon the most trivial subjects. He calculated distances, spoke a good deal of his furniture, and said that somebody at Dagurt, whose name he mentioned, owed him several days' work, which he reckoned up to amounting to twenty-seven francs. On observing the crowd as he passed through Chalamont, he said, They are very curious to see me die. On arriving at Montleur, he was placed in a room prepared for him at the Hotel de Ville, the lock-up house being out of order. His first request was to have some fire to warm his feet. A cup of coffee and a glug of sherry were then given to him, which he nipped with much relish, taking especially care to melt the sugar. On the curé of Montulieu being presented to him, he said, I know I am very guilty for having followed bad advice, but I pay for others. After this, he was alone for nearly an hour and a half with the curé and the chaplain, and whatever confession he made must have been at this interview. At six o'clock, the, the justice of the peace who had arrested him and who was charged with the direction of the execution informed the two priests that the hour was approaching. He afterwards pressed Dumoulard, with many questions, urging him to make a full confession, but the latter replied that he had nothing more to say, and that if he had had, had any declaration to make, he should not have waited for that before his execution. He repeated frequently, I pay for others. 
He remained quite firm until the executioners made the fatal toilet. Then it was observed that his nerves seemed to fail him a little. He, however, insisted on walking to the scaffold, although a carriage was in readiness. His waistcoat was thrown over his shoulder to keep him warm, and he mounted the steps of the scaffold with assistance, embraced the chaplain, and helped the executioner take off his coat, and all was over. According to one account, there were shouts resembling hurrahs among the crowd. Dumoulard's head was sent to the medical school of Lyon. Put bluntly in a French publication, Dumoulard was shortened this morning. He made no confession and died impenitent. That concludes this episode of Serial Killer Saturdays. Martin Dumoulard, the maid killer. We very much hope you enjoyed the show. If you did enjoy the show, please subscribe. Our goal is 1,000 subscribers, and with the fantastic support of our wonderful News of the Times community, we are making great progress towards that goal. We upload four days a week. Saturdays are Serial Killer Saturdays, where we do an in-depth look at a serial killer from our extensive database. The time spans of these ranges from as early as the mid-16th century to the 21st century and encompasses men, women, children and couples who kill. Mondays are murderous, where we investigate in-depth a historical murder. Wednesdays are wicked, where we pull together stories of a similar theme, such as stories of murders by starvation. And Fridays are frightful, with stories that are grouped by geographic location, allowing us to share lesser-known grisly crime stories. From all of us at the News of the Times team, Thank you again for watching or listening. This has been News of the Times, and I am Robin Coles.